Whatever happened to the Bismarck, the Admiral and the Bismarck very foolishly broke wireless silence and made a signal to uh, the German Admiralty saying that he'd had some damage, I think from the Prince of Wales, I think from the Victorious, was losing fuel and he was going to make for Brest. So um, this immediately put us in the picture because we were coming up from the south and the Bismarck was coming in from the west and the home fleet was miles astern and there was nothing except Force H, the Ark Royal, the Renown and the Sheffield between the Bismarck and Brest. Our cameraman was on board the Ark Royal at Gibraltar when that famous aircraft carrier was signaled to take part in the hunt for the Bismarck. On board was her complement of pilots and crews, eager for a chance to prove once again that the Ark Royal was still very much there. <laughs> Ark Royal sailed with the battle cruiser Renown, flagship of Admiral Somerville, who was planning with senior officers his part in the action. And there was a Catalina on patrol and she picked up the Bismarck on her radar. We then were a long way to the south and she couldn't stay very long. She was nearly at the end of her patrol. But we launched a reconnaissance of swordfish aircraft, two wings and propeller, known as Stringbergs. And they managed, with the help of the Catalina, to find the Bismarck, who was then doing a high speed towards Brest. And it was clearly up to us to... Uh, Try and intercept her. Everything was rather against us, what with the weather and these, this attacking the Sheffield and everything. And these poor chaps in the aircraft then had to come back, land on the Ark, who was pitching very severely, and another lot had to be re equipped, re armed, and some of the same ones had to go back again and have another go. All the time, of course, the uh, Bismarck was getting nearer to Brest. It was becoming more and more of a difficulty. And off they went, these gallant men, and they found the Bismarck, who put up a tremendous anti-aircraft barrages, and they didn't score any hits, or none noticeable. Another glorious page in the history of sea power. Aboard HMS Renown, Vice Admiral Somerville works out his plan of operations in the most dramatic chase in naval history. Days and nights of relentless pursuit of the Bismarck by the greatest convergence of warships ever participating in a roundup at sea. Aircraft from Ark Royal get away to deliver the crippling blow on the unsinkable pride of the swastika navy. There were three, three of us led the attack. My CO, and I was his wingman, and there was another chap called Dixon Child. And the three of us led the 15 aircraft, M3s, you see. And uh, we picked up the Sheffield and asked for a course. The course this was all by Aldous lamp, signal lamp. The CO gave the signal. Now, don't we, we had no connection with other aircraft or any ship or anything. You're on your own. 
the only thing you could talk to was your fellow behind you and the uh, navigator and your egg. So we went, we got the signal to go up. So, right, and I closed in the sky and up we went. And I went in the thick, this thick cloud. And it wasn't, it wasn't nice at all. But I hung on to the CEO because I knew he'd be all right. And I hung on to him. And eventually, 5,500 to 6,000, we, we came out of it. Well, the temperature, oh boy, did it change. It dropped, I don't know how many degrees. Uh, it, was, it was freezing. And then the next thing I could see was the, my on my wings the, the ice forming. And I thought, oh boy, no, we're in trouble now. So anyway, we kept on this course for a couple of minutes. And then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. There was all round about us shells bursting. And when I thought, oh, there's no doubt about where we are. The, the Bismarck's somewhere down there, right enough. Well, this time, the weather had deteriorated considerably, and we flew off um, into cloud and climbed up eight to 9,000 feet in cloud, in sh snow, and appalling, really, flying conditions. We, Godfrey Fawcett, who was leading the flight, my flight, he got lost from the squadron of the 15 aircraft. He had ASV, anti-surface vessel radar, and he was actually flying my aircraft. I was flying the CO's aircraft. Anyway, um, during our run up to the ship, um, in the cloud at 9,000 feet, I was in flak, and I was actually hit by the flak from the Bismarck. So she must have had some form of radar. The actual diving down is always a very um, adrenaline type time when you're diving down towards the attack, and then you turn in, but you're so hyped up when you turn in that, you know, you, you're there to do a job and you do it and get to hell out of it as quick as you can, having dropped your fish. You see, you've got to throttle right back. You're doing 120, 160 knots in the dive, and then you pull out over the water, and you've got to throttle back to get your speed down to your 90 knots. If you drop your fish too fast, it'll break up. And of course, if you drop it too high, it'll break up. He gave the signal to go and line the stern, and then he gave the signal to go down. He held the back hand, and uh, when and down I went. Now, the question, you went back into that cloud there. I mean, that's when I really began to worry because I couldn't see the, the fellow in front then. And I didn't know what the chap behind me was doing. And then I, I suddenly realised I've only got 600 feet. When I break cloud, can I make it? Because I'm only 600 feet. It all depends what angle you're at. To, to be able to pull out in time and not hit the sea. So I thought to myself, well, I've got to try and hit a, an angle if I can. I can, but there's not, our instruments didn't tell you what angle you were at. Flew with your sea your pants. And then you, you know, I just kept going down. I could see my altimeter. That was the only thing I could see it going down. So you can imagine the the, the the downward pressure there is on an aircraft with that weight under it. When I came out, and I managed to pull out, you know, just in time. And uh, looking for my others, not a sign of them. And there wasn't a sign of it at all. And just as I was pulling out of there, I could see about two miles on my starboard side, on my right hand side there, I could see this ship, this huge ship. 
And I thought, oh, boy, that's it. And we turned and started our dive, came out at about 800 feet above the water, and there was the Bismarck, a mile or so on our starboard beam, an amazing-looking ship. I, of course, seen silhouettes of her, but to see her actually... She looked vast to me, and and she looked a lovely-looking ship. We turned in, the two of us. Tony Beale, who was flying number three in our flight, he got detached and was lost from the, the formation. So that there was just Godfrey Fawcett and myself, and I was on his starboard side, and I was on the beam of the Bismarck. He was a little astern of me, about a mile ahead. We turned in and made our attack down to 90 knots, 90 feet, and we reckoned that she was doing about 20 knots. I, I shouted to Miller, is anybody behind? No, no, nobody. I thought, oh dear. So I thought, right, well, here we go. So I turned in towards that ship, and I just kept going as low as I dare get. And I, I'm not kidding when I say I knew they were firing at me because there was tracer coming out of that ship straight for me and like hail, you know. It was just... And I couldn't believe it. I thought... I mean, I was waiting for the crash, but it, it never came. And, I, and then I realized they were just skimming the top of my main plane and I held it there and I held, it went straight towards the ship well the the modernist aircraft are designed to fly at speeds of 100 and 200 miles an hour and most of the training of gunnery, even in Germany, I imagine, was for aircraft that would fly at 200 miles an hour, whereas the swordfish, at its best, was flying at 100 to 120, and most of the guns would aim too far ahead. Not only that, we got down so low on the water that the guns could not be depressed sufficiently to hit the aircraft. When I got to what you would call the dropping zone. That means a thousand five hundred. I'm heading straight to it and it's still firing at me. You know, Kenny. I couldn't believe that I wasn't being skittled out of the sky. But uh, just then a voice says to me, Not yet, John. I thought, where's that? that come from? So I, I grabbed the tube. I said, what, what's wrong? I said, not yet. And I turned, I don't want to turn, but I turned to the right. And there was this guy, the navigator, hanging outside of the aeroplane, head down, and you know, all I could see was his bottom. And he obviously had the, the tube with him because he kept shouting, not yet. And I'm getting nearer this damn bloody great ship. And nearer, you know. And I thought, oh, okay. I, it's, like, it's only in seconds, but it, 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 feels, you know, it felt like years. And then he said, let her go. And I pressed the button. And then the next thing he says, great, we've got a runner. And I realised what he was doing. You see... He was hanging over that aircraft, watching these waves. Now, if I had let my torpedo go and it had hit the top of a, a wave, it would go anywhere. There was no control. You see, you had to get it into a trough. And it, went, it would go to its depth and then run. That's what he was doing. And in that case, he really was. But there we are. We were a team, and that was it. I aimed well off over the bow, dropped the fish, 
turn hard downwind and jinked all over the sky. And of course, the ship itself, you could see all the guns firing at you in the tracer in green, red, orange, white, all coming towards you. And as we turned away, my observer, he looked over the side of the aircraft astern and saw our torpedo actually running. You could see the wake of it in the, in the sea. And ahead of me, jinking around, suddenly there were great eruptions of spray going up in the air. And, and we realized that she was firing her main armament at us in the hope that, you know, they'd drop a shell kind of somewhere near and we'd be swamped by the, by the spray. Needless to say, you see, when I press the button, the aircraft, you see, would automatically shoot up in the air. Now, that I didn't want. I pushed my stick forward as if I was going into the sea. It stopped it from rising, you know, more than maybe 50 feet or more, and back again down to the 50 feet. And then I had to get turned. That was the next thing. To get, to get away. Now, the th thing is, if you turn, you've got to go up because of your wings in the water. And you present the whole of your bloody aeroplane to the ship. Not in your life. I did a ski turn. I put a full rudder on there and yanked around, going flat like that. So I managed to get around and get us going the other way as fast as I could. Scouting planes left the Ark Royal to find the Bismarck, and swordfish torpedo bombers took off to fly in the face of terrific anti-aircraft fire. This was to prove another perfect example of sea-air cooperation. Air torpedoes reduced the speed of the Bismarck, enabling the British battleship to catch up on her flying start. And we were plotting. By that time, we'd got the Sheffield radar uh, track of the Bismarck. And we were plotting her course, rushing towards Brest. And suddenly, she stopped rushing towards Brest, which was the most elating thing. Couldn't believe it. All the while, our aircraft was still with her and attacking her. And she did the most extraordinary turn round which she shouldn't have done because every yard she made towards Brest was important to her. And uh, we watched with interest what was happening. And she continued this turn and appeared to lose speed. And we waited for our aircraft to return to see whether anyone had scored a hit. And what had happened was that the last attack by the last torpedo bomber and I think it's called Sub-Lieutenant Beale he couldn't get into position to score a hit so very gallantly he went round again and had another go fired his torpedo and hit her in the propellers but we didn't know about this till he landed on. Getting, them, getting the aircraft back was uh, preoccupying us more than almost anything because it was dark by then and really rough. And he said he thought he scored a hit. And it all was true. And the Bismarck was then done because she could not make enough ground to the eastward. The home fleet was by that time coming up from astern. And she was a sitting duck. There's a, some dispute as to which aircraft did it. I think it was a chap called Beale, but it, 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 hazy memories of the past. Sub Lieutenant Beale. Anyway, because he got detached and, and he came in after the main strike had gone in and missed, or they'd had some near misses and so on. And it was. Anyway, whoever says whoever did the actual drop that, that um, messed up the whole of the steering arrangements of Bismarck doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter that 
99 out of the 100 torpedoes dropped, only one achieved a significant blow. What matters is that as a result of this thing, Bismarck had to turn around. She was unsteerable, and she had to turn around. Instead of steering east, she had to steer northwest. and was straight into the arms of the enemy. Uh, her fate was sealed the moment that tor aerial torpedo was dropped. Now, it didn't matter a damn whether Tovey had 100,000 battleships hanging around or none. It made no difference whatsoever. Hitler was um, uh, sending signals saying um, anybody who managed to uh, restore the integrity of the steering gears would get the Iron Cross about 3,000 times multiplied by brilliance and everything else. And uh, the, 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 the dreadful drama on board the Bismarck. But the funny bit is, you're supposed to lay off what you reckon the speed the ship was going at. But I didn't. Don't ask me why. I did not. All I did was to straight at the bow of that ship and let it go. I mean, it was so big, I thought, I'll never miss it. Can't possibly miss it. When I, I, I got away and I was able to look back, what happened, the Bismarck turned away from my torpedo. And according to the, a fellow who was coming at my back somewhere, that I was the only one that could possibly have hit the rear end of that Bismarck because of where, the way it turned and the way, where I had dropped. Because he saw the explosion, you see. And uh, I didn't. The interesting thing was that um, uh, because basically Charles Friend and Bug Beale in, in a swordfish from uh, I think 810 they they um, they they got lost and went to Sheffield and asked the way and Sheffield sort of said over there and um, they uh, they caught Bismarck when she was in a turn having just seen her because she had the main party attack but they of course hit her in the rudders and jammed the whole lot so she went round in circles from that moment onwards when I got back of course they said you know had, did anybody get a hit at all how could you possibly and seas like that and you can't claim anything and I said I don't care who it is we're just lucky to be back as far as I'm concerned anyway I said I don't know where, where my torpedo ended up I do not know but all I know is it did run you see so that I was able to tell and that's all We joined up and returned to the ship and landed on just at dusk with a 50-foot rise and fall on the flight deck. But, of course, we had then, we had barriers and we had um, deck landing control officers that waved us off if the ship was pitching too badly. And there's always a, a, a pause between the pitching, then she'll settle down and then he'd bring us on. All the aircraft landed on safely. By that time, it was dark when we were all on, and um, we waited until the morning when we were rearmed again and um, spotted on the deck. We were on deck, ready for takeoff, wondering, you know, wondering when we'd actually go. And then we could hear the gunfire and knew that the home fleet was engaging the Bismarck. They were pleased to see that we got back, every one of us. They couldn't believe it. Uh, uh, but oh, I certainly felt very vulnerable. I really did. But, I mean, don't forget, these, uh, the, uh, we didn't quite escape completely. There were holes in the canvas 
because you see it's 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 metal and canvas, you see, and 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 a lot of the aircraft had had uh, uh, holes in them, but uh, they were able to be <laughs> repaired because they were canvas, you see. Uh, yeah. uh, that, that's the soldier said, the air tire, uncanny, that aeroplane. Really is. Uh, amazing. Um, when I got back, to, I felt the jolt and I smelt the cordite. And when I got back to the ship that evening, my rigger brought me a piece of shrapnel which was in the bottom of the aircraft and it had the rifling of the barrel of the gun that fired it on one side and the thread of the screw on the air bottle of my brake um, air bottle on the other side. And I had it sent and analysed as we were asked to and then of course I got it back. But unfortunately returning to England after I'd left the Art Royal, the squadron was disbanded. I was sunk in a convoy, and of course I lost it. But it would have been a nice replica to have. Well, I think there was a general feeling of satisfaction. Um, also a feeling of sort of um, frustration, because 810 was airborne, um, and I think some others, 818 Squadron 2, with torpedoes, to go and do the coup de grace. And we weren't called on at all. Um, and we had to land back. And the, the flight deck stern was going, moving through 50 or 60 feet. For the moves. They, they landed on with their torpedoes, and I don't think there was any um, undercarriages broken or anything, which um, speaks very highly of the flying uh, ability of, of the pilots. A modern navy is made up of 101 different craft. All naval success depends on these units working together as one team. From the five-ton reconnaissance plane to the 35,000-ton battleship. These are some of the tools with which we shall finish the job. The Navy is a mighty weapon in the hands of the men who plan the strategy and of the men who carry out the task of seeking out and destroying the enemy wherever he may be found. In the meantime, we were getting a bit close, and the Bismarck, uh, her heavy armament had been uh, primed with high angle uh, shells. And the first two, she saw us and she opened fire. And the first two shells were high uh, impact shells, and uh, they, one came over the stern, which was. Uh, uh, an awful sound and when one went forward the one that came over half was near where we were closed up before that I'd been over on the starboard quarter and I saw the Bismarck actually open fire whether it was the ones the shells that came over that I saw it was against the aircraft I don't know but we were told it immediately to get closed up and I got to the gun and for some unknown reason the captain of the gun wanted to sit in my seat so I stood up with the phones on and as I said this shell came and, and exploded and all the shrapnel came came inboard I can remember one of the ABs being brought down from the after DCT uh, his brains were uh, outside of his tin helmet and he was taken down below because he died uh, a piece of shrapnel came through the gun shield fortunately for me I was standing up and it hit the captain of the gun who was in my seat in the arm 
So, but it, it was only a slight injury. But the worst uh, what case was a friend of ours, Abel Seaman Taylor, who was he was at ammunition supply and he was situated in the officer galley flat, and he was sitting down uh, against the wire mesh which separated the, the flat and the galley, and this bit of shrapnel went through the ship side, through a kettle through this iron mesh and hit him in the back and he fell forward and they thought he was skylarking but he wasn't they took him down to the after sick bay which was the emergency sick bay and uh, he, he they sort of tended to him but I still think that uh, they moved him the next day from there to the proper sick bay and to get in there they had to take him up some ladder up a ladder and it's just my theory that I think the shrapnel moved and it killed him so we lost three men there there was one or two others injured but uh, that was our first casualties of the, really of the war through enemy action we made smoke and got out of it and but we continued shadowing her until nearly dark when we were relieved by the destroyers who carried on doing you know the rest of the night the shadowing well I thought well again how lucky we are and you know when you think that she had sunk the hood in six minutes and we'd been shadowing her for two or three hours we uh, we were lucky and um, we was relieved when when we got out but we were closed up all night and we could hear uh, firing and explosions going on because the, the, the stores carried out one or two torpedo runs on her she was shadowed all night by the destroyers uh, the Cossack with Admiral Vaughan and they shadowed her all night uh, but they had no radar, you see. Had to be done visually. And she was capable of very accurate gunfire, that was what Captain Vaughan reported. So they had a hell of a time. And they dodged in and out. And then up came the King George V with radar. And her, the rest of the home fleet. And uh, attacked her. And well, the story is well known, she wouldn't sink. And eventually the cruiser Dorsetshire had to be ordered to sink her with torpedoes which was one up for the torpedo department of the Royal Navy The backbone of the Navy has always been the battleship the modern battleship is armed with heavy guns which can fire more than 15 miles. It is protected by immensely strong steel armor. A battleship can give and take more punishment than any other ship afloat. The aircraft carrier is the great new naval weapon. She is as fast as a cruiser but only carries small guns for defense. Her offensive power lies in her torpedo bombers and her fighter aircraft. So in strides the home fleet. They open fire at 18,000 yards. Bismarck replies. They know it's the end. Their morale's down. Of course, they know there's no, there was no future. If they'd gone up and sent a picket boat across with a little party of Marines, they'd probably be handed over the ship anyway and said safe conduct to a neutral port. Anything might have happened, you could have said. But the fate was sealed. Then they fired at 18,000 yards. What did they do? After they'd sort of um, more or less bashed most of the uh, uh, ship's firing ability, they closed the range down to six or 7,000 yards. I can only imagine that the spirit of Nelson and close quarter gunnery was still invading them. They wanted to see the blood spurt. They wanted to get to close quarters. But of course all they were doing was closing the range they were firing over what they called open sights. They were firing horizontal guns. 
they blew the upper works almost into a shambles. Nothing lived, nothing survived on the upper deck. But down below water, integrity was not breached at all. I couldn't believe it. I could hear the bombardment going on. We were about 30 miles away in Ark Royal with Renan. I could hear the great guns firing. And there came a signal from CNC Home Fleet, unable to sink Bismarck by gunfire. Now, they, they, they want to forget that signal, for they don't report it anywhere. I read it. I read it on the flag deck of Ark Royal, because it was repeated. For once now, they repeated some of their signals to the carrier. So, what happened? The ship was lying stationary in the water, so they sent in, he sent in Dorsetshire uh, to fire torpedoes. By this time, um, uh, she'd been reduced to scrap, uh, that's Bismarck. Then it was very much uh, the Navy, as opposed to the Air Branch, getting in for the kill. Here we have a degree of politics. The Navy lost Hood, and therefore the Navy lost Hood gun to gun, and the, the, the surface ships were going to kill it, not these upstarts of aviators. That's what I meant by politics gunfire you could hear it on on the flight deck we took off i think that i think that was the next i think it was 11 aircraft that took off for the last attack anyway it was the same routine godfrey fawcett and myself and tony beale and the other number three we flew up climbed up and were then told that to, to lay off and, uh, and not attack her immediately while she was being engaged by gunfire. And the CO led us round um, to the leeward side so that we could attack, attack up in her smoke because she was burning. You know, there was smoke coming from the, 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 the control tower and um, we were going to attack there. But then she suddenly, one I could see you know, that one gun on the forward turret was up in the air, the other one was drooping down towards the deck. She was down by the bow, listening to port. And as I watched, she rolled over. After the victory, the First Lord came aboard to congratulate the Royal Navy on their triumph. You can imagine the feelings of the ship's company at this moment. The destruction of the Bismarck, that great and powerful ship, had to be accomplished to be true to the traditions of the British Royal Navy, because in the Navy, I know officers and men know how to avenge the loss of those who are comrades and many of whom have been shipmates. But I can tell you this, that when Bismarck was lying dead in the water, upstairs in the air were 21 swordfish, each with a 19-inch torpedo with contact heads. And you would have thought, you just might have thought, that the C&C would have appreciated that the whole business of bringing Bismarck to bay was done by a swordfish. They could have handed the palm or the glory or the disaster or the distasteful task of the finish, the coup de grace, by saying to the Ark Royal, send your torpedo bombers in to sink the Bismarck. What happened? They sent the Dorchester in and the Ark Royal squadrons were ordered to ditch their torpedoes safe into the Atlantic Ocean. 
because they, the sea was so rough they could not land on with a torpedo. Now, I'd like you just to try and imagine the shock, the indignation, almost the anger. I still feel this anger. Oh dear. How could someone be so dreadfully ununderstanding and sending those silly signals? There were men jumping over the side, and they were, there she was. She went. We flew down. The CO put us into line astern in a gaggle, and we flew down over the survivors and waved to them in the water, but there wasn't anything we could do. We flew back, landed on, and um, that was it. The ship turned round, and we went back to Jim. We witnessed the sinking of her, because we were about to drop our torpedoes when she turned over on her side. And... To see all those people in those, uh, yeah, about four or five hundred or more, or whatever the hell it was, in the seas. I mean, with no chance to, no, no chance at all to live. You know, a terrible thing. Yeah. Everybody, when we got back, uh, uh, you know, we told uh, nobody. There was no. Euphoria, or you might call it, no. Because they were sailors. We were sailors. And you know, never the grace of God go by. The story of this great naval battle is not wholly one of triumph. Behind the cheering and the smiles of victory, there is the memory of another great ship that was lost. HMS Hood and her gallant crew were part of the price of this victory. But we may hope that that tragedy has played its part in establishing Britain's sea power even more firmly than before. A tender comes alongside with a very different cargo. They are the German sailors who were picked out of the water when the Bismarck went down. Probably you can't in honesty say that you're glad they were rescued. They belong to a race that has stained the face of the wide world with the blood of innocent men, women and children. But the Navy picked them up because that is the Navy's tradition. We'll leave it at that. Except to reflect that the Navy was unable to rescue more because of the danger of submarines. Those who live by the sword shall perish by the sword.